questions. So I'm going to start at the end with Tracy Curley. So Tracy Curley, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> She is a well-known activist and medical patient advocate in Toronto and across Canada. She started her career by working as a project coordinator in a dispensary around 2004 and used her skills and, uh, as an event and project coordinator to facilitate many public outreach and educational initiatives. She continues to work with patients, dispensaries and various legalization organizations towards the goal of dignified access for patients. Tracy has also co-hosted Opus Live on POT TV in 2014, and now she hosts her own YouTube channel, Baked with Tracy Curley, where yeah. she instructs others how to bake medibles at home as a way to provide access to smoking alternatives. Woo. Our uh, next panelist is Amy Brown, also known as Amy Anonymous. Woo. <laughs> she is a Toronto-based entrepreneur and a well-known baker and patient advocate. She recently opened her own successful medical cannabis dispensary in the city, Can Do, which also won the Lyft Canadian Cannabis Award last year for Best Dispensary in Canada. And that was only in its first year. Uh, she is also featured on various social media outlets, and you guys might remember her on the Dean Blundell Show on 102.1 in her own segment called Blunt News with Amy Anonymous. She also runs one of my favorite holiday drives titled Milk and Cookies uh, for the Homeless yeah. Project where she distributed things like winter coats, hats, and scarves, and quite literally milk cookies and cannabis for over 50 um, community members of Toronto. Yeah. Cool. Our next panelist is Joanne Baker, also known as Puff Mama. <laughs> she is an Ontario-born activist and entrepreneur, currently running two businesses, including the Underground Cafe, which hosts like tons of great comedy, burlesque shows, um, and music. She's also involved in organizing a small music festival called Puff Jam which is an annual gathering. Her hobbies include things like baking cookies, reading books, camping, and long walks on the beach. <laughs> and lastly, might be a familiar face, we have Erin Goodwin, who's the co-manager of this space, so Vapor Central, where we are with her spouse. And she also has a heavy hand in organizing the state each year for 420 um, Toronto at Young and Dundas Square. She's born and raised in Thornhill. Erin um, studied radio and television arts at Ryerson, and she's worked with Rogers Television on Reel to Reel for five seasons. She's also involved in provincial politics with the Freedom Party of Ontario and has run for MPP three times. Yeah. Woo! Awesome. So essentially, I'm going to ask a question, and I'll usually just direct them to the entire panel. So whoever feels comfortable kind of jumping in, please do so. Um, you can take up to three to five minutes to answer any question. Um, I also encourage any other panelists to kind of chime in whenever you're feeling it. Um, and there's, uh, I'll be doing a bit of a time check, a gentle time check, just to kind of keep us on track because we have a lot of really cool stuff to cover. So we're going to get started. You guys ready? Yeah. You guys yep. ready? Yeah. Woo! Okay. So the first question I wanted to open with was, um, seeing that you guys have all been involved in the cannabis space for various lengths of time, how have you seen women's role in the cannabis industry change um, over time, if at all? Um, I'm gonna start that one. All right, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, oh, you have it on. Yeah. I got the sound off. Yeah, I don't have my mic. It's, I can't get one Testing. You want my mic? Hold on. Technical difficulties. We were the guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> We had a hypnotist in last night, and I think uh, he, he unplugged that mic channel. I'm going to steal this mic in the meantime. Um, my experience, it's, it's kind of funny, because I've been listening to uh, how we were introduced and what our bios were. Uh, very early on in the cannabis industry, a woman got involved in the industry by being a baker. Um, that, was, that was how we got involved, is because traditionally that was our role. Women make cookies, right? Um, but that is really changing. Um, I'm, I'm meeting, now they're, you know, the female and run dispensaries. Um, I ran into Abby Roach, who runs the uh, Hot Box Cafe, um, and Rocharama. She's opening up her, her uh, new dispensary in November. Um, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot more female entrepreneurship outside of medibles. Um, and, and, I, and I think we're finding it, even in, with yourself, new activists, writers, new skill sets that we've never seen in this industry before um, because there is a real growth in, in women in the movement. Um, 
Jenna herself, her chair is actually a chair of Women Grow. I went to their first meeting and, and it's the largest gathering of women I've seen um, within this industry at any of the meetings we've ever had. You sold it, they sold out their first signature event and I suspect their second one will be even larger. So I'm, I'm really excited about where women are actually coming out. There's, there's a lot more growth there. M mothers are, are no longer um, afraid. Uh, women in, in stiletto stoners, you're seeing a whole new brand of, of women, I guess, is, is that, you know, it wasn't just bakers. Now you've got, you know, this, this whole thing about um, business women and lawyers and everything on, on, on Bay Street who smoke cannabis recreationally. Um, we're talking about medical, we're talking about grandmothers. There's this, this great growth that I'm seeing, and, and especially when you see the wide variety of kind of um, uh, experience that you see here as well, from politics to healthcare to entertainment to everything, I think it's just gonna keep growing. I, yeah, I think also that, uh, yeah, clap for yeah, Trace. That was good. That my was talk. Good. That was good. Um, I think one thing I just want to point out that we're very lucky in Canada to be women in this movement. Oh, yeah. uh, you look at some women that have to deal with what they have to deal with in some states. Some are fairly liberal, but some are not. You look at women outside of North America, what they have to do, they don't have the opportunities that we have. And given that the cannabis industry is a very network based, we're very, had to be very underground and network. Women are real networky. And so when you give us an opportunity to do that, we spread like wildflowers. So I just feel like that we've been given an opportunity here in Canada and we've taken it by storm. And we need to infect other women across the world because the world's never gonna be legal until we've networked. And not to say that men aren't good at that, they network differently, that's all. And uh, having both sides approach to it, but obviously I can't help men network, maybe feed them some cookies, but in the end, it's the networking that's important right now because from there, we grow, so. Yay, Canada. Uh, I was just gonna mention that the industry, as we've all known, is growing and legalization seems like it's just around the corner. So I think that as it gets less risky for people, you'll see both men and women getting involved. I just knocked this camera out. But uh, <laughs> it's sensitive. But uh, you'll see that it's, there's more and more opportunity for everyone and uh, it's exciting times right now. Yeah. I am. Um, I I agree with everything that you ladies are saying. With women are starting to step up in this industry. Uh, most women were were visualized as you know the little sex kitten of the industry, and with not much skills other than in the kitchen, a woman's role. Um, so seeing women progress, and like you said, entrepreneurs. We've got, we've got so many fabulous women in this industry that are coming up and using their brains as opposed to their bodies, um, in which to show that this is a legit. Uh, industry and there, there's knowledge in this and it's not a it's not a sexual trade it's about medicine um, and I think to me as a female who stands for all this I find it very important to see women starting to get out of the kitchen and open their own shops and I, I'd love to see many more female dispensary owners out there I think there are too few this is a very yeah. male dominated yeah. industry and sorry men but the ladies will take over <laughs> actually I've got to argue with that a little bit. What? Tracy? Because the fact of the matter is, is that the frontline workers of the, the, the women, the, the first dispensary in this country was started by a fucking woman, and nobody ever talks about that. So if you don't know who Hillary Black is, if you don't know who Rael Kapler is, if you don't know who Jamie Shaw is, if you don't know who the women who are actually working in this industry are, Dory Dempster, who runs the dispensaries. Um, Dana Larson may own them, but it's Dory Dempster who runs them. Yeah. If you don't know who these women are, do your fucking homework because we're already here. We've already been doing the work. We're just not getting the fucking credit. Exactly, Tracy. Exactly. That's really great. Thank you. And that's actually a really, really good point is that when we walk into places like dispensaries and things like that, a lot of the frontline workers are actually female and they're doing a lot of the day to day, the on the ground kind of stuff. So. I want to uh, direct this next question at, um, I'm going to ask Amy this question because uh, I've talked to her about this before. Um, I want to know what are some personal challenges in this space in dealing with, 
you know, what we can conservatively call unconscious bias towards women, all the way to outright sexism that exists in the cannabis world. Oh, that's a deep one. It's a big one. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I've, experienced, I've experienced many unwanted sexual um, advances in this industry because if they think, you know, oh, you're a female in this industry, I can dominate it and overpower you because I have a penis. That doesn't work in my life. Um, I personally haven't experienced that much sexualizing other than in a previous position I was in. Um, in uh, but other than that, I mean, I find most men are quite respectful of women in this movement. Yep. Um, I, I really, really, really do. Um, there are some, there's a bad apple in every bunch that can, you know, take this away from you. But it is true, the men do get a lot of the credit. Uh, the women do a lot of the work, and the men just suck up all the credit for it. Um, and as seen in, I, I mean, I think you've all known my role previously yet before I can do, as seen in that as well, the women were, were kind of kept lower than the men. The women were paid less than the men. The women didn't get raises that the men got. And that is not bullshit. That is 100% true. I think he's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, that is 100% true. But, so, but this is a panel and not a comedy show, so we don't need hecklers, so I'm just going to kind of no, put that in there. But this is very... Sean, sorry, Sean Tedder, keep your voice down. This is very true, though. <laughs> Women in this industry do experience that. Um, and and it's, it's a lot more common than you know. Not as much... like. Previously, the past couple years, I have to say, women have really stepped up their game, and the respect level that we're receiving is phenomenal. And it's nice to be a part of. It's very nice because of five years ago, I couldn't say the same. I think I just want to have a quick say too. Uh, I come from the bar industry. Um, I, I I got wedded out in a in a real biker type bar in a small town. So I'm going to just say that we actually have a much lower percentage of sexism in many many industries. We do experience it. I, I don't even dress hot and I get it sometimes. Um, but a small part of me is being a little bit of a tomboy. It's like, catch me if you can. Um, I'm not going to fight it. It's always going to be there. But, but the bar industry, when I worked in the bar and have like super, super drunk guys, you could be the ugliest girl, you could be the prettiest girl. It didn't matter. There was a tit in front of you or an ass and it would get grabbed. And that was, the, that was the problem with alcohol in the industry. You take all these same people, you give us all a keg of beer, there's going to be some problems by the end of it. It's not happening today because of the nature of what we're doing. So I think that the cannabis actually puts little balls in some women and it calms down some of the men. We become a little more equal and a little more tolerable. It's out there. It's always going to be. But there's always going to be gold digging bitches too. So. Yeah. Uh, Tracy, did you want to add something? I... I look at it as is there. Are, it's it's in you know sexism and and gender equality is is still an issue and it's kind of everywhere, but I think it it's something that I observe more when I'm I'm observing other women that I admire or other other people that I admire. Um, a prime example is sitting in the Vancouver Seed Bank with Rebecca Ambrose. Uh, who is awesome and amazing and having gentlemen come in and uh, growers come in and ask about seeds and she will give them amazing advice because she's incredibly informed and then the grower will look at the 18 year old boy who works for her and says so what do you think <laughs> you know so it's it's subtle but it's, it's, subtle. There. it's there and and the fact that you know if you're if you know Sarah Sunday who unfortunately couldn't be here today because she's getting ready to, to start the Karma Cup She's an incredibly talented grower, um, but, but she really has to hustle it more to get the same recognition as a grower as, as some of these other guys. You know, she does a beautiful job, um, but she's had to work really hard to make that name for herself, and I would say twice yep. as hard as, as most. Um, and again, I've watched as she's talked about growing, and then they've looked at her partner and asked him the next question because but he's not the grower, he's her assistant. And people, you know, and, but people automatically look at the man. So like, again, it's subtle, it's still there. Again, I think it's changing. But again, I'm, I'm looking at these people and we're talking about dispensaries and I say the name Hillary Black and they say, who? Mm -hmm. And that's our history. So I, I'm, I'm, af I'm always afraid when we don't know our history that we are doomed to repeat it and keep discounting these, these incredibly women. I mean, Hillary and Riel, and as well as Kirk Tusa, they have a Queen's Jubilee medal for their policy work. Um, pay attention to the people who've come before you. That's yeah. all. Yeah, that's a really great point. 
Um, so now I want to turn the topic a little bit to the election. That's kind of, you know, one of the really big things that at Normal we're working on right now. Um, and I think a lot of the time we hear, we've been talking about legalization, we've been hearing about legalization, and it often comes from a male perspective. So I thought it would be really cool if we get the opinions of these four ladies up here on what's happening in Canada, you know, what, what's happening with legalization. Um, and so I'm really excited to um, hear the thoughts and the opinions. So I'm going to start the first question. I'm going to ask Aaron. So the Liberals have said they're going to legalize, uh, while NDP has said to us they're going to decriminalize um, personal possession, and then they're going to have a commission to determine how to regulate cannabis. The NDP haven't said the word legalize, and a lot of people are kind of swayed to vote for the Liberals because of this legalization stance. Um, but there are still things that concern us about the Liberals, right? So. Aaron, should we stay quiet and focus on getting the Liberals elected? Well, I, our focus is to get the li Liberals elected. As Paul mentioned earlier, it's, it's so uh, historic that they're approaching the election with this agenda. So I think it's our duty to, to push forth in legalization, but I don't think we should ever stay quiet in politics on any issues. We need to voice our opinions, our concerns. Uh, we've been watching all the debates, so getting the feel for each... Uh, politician and leader and then discussing it is very important. Um, I've got concerns about Bill C-51 that it was signed by the Liberals as many of us do and it's a hot topic as well as other issues. Uh, so I think it's important that we stand by that and address that and the more we talk about it the more likely it'll be brought, brought forward to Justin. Does anyone else want to comment on that? I just think that you should never shut up. <laughs> Just, you got I've this. historically been NDP, yeah. so um, and and I was a, a great admirer of Jack Layton, um, and, and you know it's really hard to face this election and kind of not think about how would it have been different if if maybe Jack were leader of the party right now. Um, but at this point, I mean, I've I've said this to a number of people, and and though I'm not normal, I'm not a single issue voter, so it's actually been interesting to watch what. Mulcair, Mulcair is saying about women's issues or not saying about women's issues. Um, what, what Trudeau is saying about women's rights and, and their rights to their own body and abortion issues. So whereas, you know, traditionally I have been NDP, I, I'm willing to give the Liberals a shot this time. And I mean, I look at it this way. It's like, if they don't keep their fucking promise, then they'll pay for it in four years. Yeah. You know, that's it. For me, voting liberal, I, I also am NDP all the way, all the way. And I have to say, Jack Layton was a big reasoning for that. Um, I personally don't trust the liberals. And I know you're all going to oh, boo Amy, but I don't. I don't trust the liberals. Um, I don't trust Justin, Justin Trudeau. I do think he does have great ideas. But do we want to trust him to put those ideas into play and when? And will he really do that? I remember in 2009, he was saying that anyone who used cannabis should be locked up and cannabis was not a medicine or marijuana. He was not saying cannabis and marijuana is not a medicine. And I know people's opinions change, times change, people change, but he hasn't won me yet. I mean, I'm encouraging everyone to vote strategically too. Anything to mm -hmm. get the conservatives out, right? ABC. Mm -hmm. But I, I could not tell everyone to vote liberal without having a little bit more background. I mean, I know I've, I've, I've paid very much attention to their campaigning, but again, at the moment, at this moment, I don't trust Justin Trudeau. Hate me now. <laughs> yeah. I think it's also important always to question um, these, these, these things, like if someone tells you vote liberal or vote NDP, listen to their reasons, like we are all today listening to Paul Lewin. That's, like, that's important for us to know these little bits. But at the same time, sometimes you have to look at these things like, oh, what is the lesser of two evils? Like, let's all face it, all parties are fucking corrupt. All government is corrupt. It's just the nature of the game. But in the end, what is, what is it the lesser of two evils? And sometimes, who's best in your riding? So maybe you never voted liberal, but maybe, like, take out the whole picture. Who's going to serve your community? I live in Riverside. It's an extremely tight community. And Paula Fletcher has been our counselor forever. And we've we just got a real tight community that way. And I'm seeing like lots of red and orange posters on there, pretty much equal. But in the end, I mean, we are all agreeing to oust the conservatives. But uh, so sometimes in the end, if you can't decide, just decide for your personal writing. 
Yeah, and I'm really happy that you guys kind of drew out this tension that I think a lot of people are struggling with between NDP and Liberals, especially people who have, you know, been longtime NDPers are kind of thinking, you know, it, it's, it's hard when you're looking at, you know, legalization, and that's been a goal for a lot of you guys for so long, and you've been fighting towards this. So when they say they actually are not afraid to come out and say legalization, um, there is some, some merit in that as well. So thank you, ladies, for um, drawing that out. Um, so... When I asked everybody, you know, what else you guys wanted to chat about, a lot of people wanted to hear, you know, what does legalization actually mean? Um, it's certainly not, you know, a cookie cutter type situation. There's not one size fits all. There's lots of different models that legalization can take. Um, but first I wanted to maybe take a second to think about prohibition and how prohibition affects us and how prohibition affects different people differently, right? So now we start thinking about things like gender and race and how, you know, that impacts how people are affected by, you know, unjust um, drug laws. So since we have a group of women here, I wanted to ask you guys, um, how does prohibition affect women in different ways? Maybe ways that we don't, you know, necessarily think about, um, but it's, you know, for me, it's kind of tied in all these roles, all these hats that we have. Jody Emery posted a Twitter, a story on Twitter this morning uh, about a woman who was stopped in the middle, uh, was stopped at a traffic stop and uh, was a victim of an illegal search when police threatened to just basically take her children if they didn't let her, them search the vehicle. Very rarely do you ever hear of a man being threatened to lose custody of his children when he's arrested, but that's the first thing they threaten to take away from a woman. It's the first thing they do, and, and, and it's what makes us kind of the weak link in this industry is because, you know, our gender also makes us as the protector of the children. And, and when they threaten that, I mean, there's, there's really, you know, what, what I don't blame women who have had to stay in the closet. I've been, you know, it, it's kind of strange that I say this unfortunate or fortunate, but I myself had never had children. Um... And that has given me a certain freedom because I can stand up and yell for women who can't um, and can use my real name without having to hide and worry about whether or not CAS is going to come knocking on my door, um, whether or not my neighbors are going to think I'm a bad mother because I may be a medical user, for God's sakes. That might just be doing it to, to Chain, uh, help with the quality of my life and make sure that I could raise my children better. It's, it's, and that's just one. And then we start talking about, you know, the, the horrible things that happen to people when they're arrested and the bullying and the everything else. Now add the fear of rape into that because that's what women experience when they're arrested because those are the kinds of horrible things that police say to men. Why wouldn't they say them to women? You know, um, and these are things, and these are the, the kinds of things that women have PTSD about after they've been arrested, and why they're afraid, and why they don't want to speak out, and these are the stories that other women hear, and that's why they're still hiding in their basement or in the back sheds in their backyards, so, not, so no one will know that they use cannabis. Very good point. Did you want to ask I'm a mother. I have an eight-year-old child, and I have experienced this on numerous occasions. Um, when I went through a raid, the police officers asked me, where's your child and how is he doing? And my question was, well, why are you asking about my child? And I think it was a fear, you know, it was, it was a... Intimidation. I, I would, and, and it did scare me. Yeah. My name was everywhere. All over the clinic I was at, everywhere you could find me, no matter what. And when they asked me about my child, Sebastian, I panicked. I got very scared. Um, it wasn't because I was a girl and I wasn't a strong person. It was because of my child is my life. As a mother, I mean, I couldn't imagine someone <coughs> taking away my child for a plant or a plant use. I have dealt with children's aid numerous times. I couldn't count the amount of times that I have had to deal with children's aid at my house because of my use for cannabis. Fortunately, I'm a very strong woman. Um, I've never been intimidated by anyone, you know, other, other than when you bring my child in. Um, and I, I stood up for myself, you know. I went through the day of fear, and then it was, who the heck are you to threaten I? You know, and children's aid would come in and do a run through. They want to check all my paperwork, see if my child has clothing, if he's eating right. This is all because I use cannabis as a painkiller. So I have experienced this a lot, and what I can recommend to women is stand tall. 
Um, if you know what you're doing is right, stand up for it. Because if you sit down, no one else is going to stand up for you. And, um, and I'm going to add, and if you got, you know, hey, there's lots of us women out here. You need help, you can't I got stand you. up, we'll stand up for you. Exactly. And that's the good thing about women. We, we, as catty as we can be towards each other, let's not <laughs> deny that, we do stand together when times are tough. Um, and... And mothers, mothers really do get the brunt end of this. They really, really, really do. I don't know if there's any other mothers on the panel. Yeah, we, we do. Um, maybe you could speak up. Yeah, I'm a stepmother, so I deal with uh, Chris's ex, who has, we have uh, two stepkids, and uh, I know that they, like, st st uh, they previously were involved in the industry, and then after having children, they stepped back because of, the, because of the risks and the dangers involved, and Chris has been threatened to have his child taken away by CAS. So it is a, a very real thing. And he still gets letters written to him how, how he was able to beat them in his, in his charges. And he, ju he did just stand tall. But there are so many mothers who, who, because of the stigma and the fear and the judgment, they, they have to take it, this out of their life where they'll just stop using as a result because it becomes too much, the pressure. So it's sad because it could help so many people in so many ways. And just with this cloud over everything, we, we need to have it lifted so more people are able to use comfortably and safely. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, so Tracy, thanks so much for bringing out kind of the unique role that women play as mothers and as caregivers. And I think that's really important. And Amy and Aaron for kind of drawing on some personal experience there. Um, but, you know, just some food for thought. What happens when, you know, CAS is, is bugging families where, you know, they don't have such strong voices. You know, you guys are leaders. So just some food for thought. You know, what happens to the women that maybe don't have kind of the social capital to kind of speak up for themselves? Um, so that's a really, really great point. Uh it, it's very true. I'm not saying it's easy. I am not. I, as I told you, I was scared at first. I, there's no way I'd lose my child for anything, anyone. Oh, and, and you can see that by, and you can see actually where that actually stands by female incarceration statistics. Mm -hmm. Native women are, are our highest uh, population in the female prisons. A lot of those are drug charges or um, um, things like and, and, and I don't know what our stats on are, are on specific cannabis charges. Maybe someone from normal actually knows. Um, but, uh, you know, when we, when we see that, it's, it's not, you know, it's not the faces that you see in this panel right now. It's not, it's not middle-class white women. Yeah. Um, it is, it is, um, it is racially Very slanted and economically yeah. slanted. Yes. And, and poor people go to prison for yeah. marijuana and rich white people don't. It's yeah. very true, and as I said, I don't think it's easy, but I do recommend doing it. I mean, stand up for yourself. Yeah, and if you can't, course. if you cannot, find someone who can. Here find four, one of us. Four powerful women. Yep. There are many others in the industry we that would will be able yell to for you. and help right. um, and, and, and show you that this is not okay and intimidation is not going to work. And we're really lucky that we've got some fabulous lawyers in our group that uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, like helping people too. So, you know. Great. Um, Great. I, so I want to kind of shift now to some proposed frameworks for legalization or talking a bit more about what you guys think legalization really means. So I'm going to bring up the CAMH report, the dorky side of me. And it was pretty conservative, but I think that there were, you know, there were lots of things that were missing, in, in my opinion. But I think it was really symbolic that we had the largest research institution in Canada kind of come out in favor of legalization. So if we take anything away from that, you know, we can take that away from it. Um, so one of the suggestions that they make in that framework is this idea that there should be a government monopoly on the sale and distribution as part of a more safe um, public health model. Um, do you guys agree with this? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's clear across So the why don't we start with, you know, what does legalization look like to you? What does it mean to you? Does anyone want to go first? Do you want to go? No yeah, okay, we'll start with Aaron. <laughs> Um. Well, with legalization, there's so many different ways it could go. I think the main thing is that the arrests need to cease. Um, like the summer of legalization from February to October of 2003, uh, there were almost there were hundreds of thousands of charges that were just dropped. And I think that's the first thing we need to see is the end of prison in, in pot. 
Um, but then, uh, in terms of personal growing and how are we going to move forward, I believe that people should always be able to grow small amounts for themselves. And then, once you get to commercial, it's gonna, there's going to be steps that have to be taken. So whether it's um, uh, like the setup that they're working towards in Vancouver, where you pay a fee and there's some sort of regulation. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it'll, it'll get down to municipalities. Every area will have to decide what's best for them, but I would love to see federal legalization. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, well, as a person that runs a social club, um, most of my customers are not medical, so I really feel I have to speak behalf on the recreational people out there. But then I also look at all substances could be medical. I need a coffee in the morning. <laughs> and on a hot day when you've been working real hard doing some construction, what's better than a cold beer in a patio? That's medicine, folks. All of it is. Good medicine is uh, also has a parabole and some of those things like too much coffee, not good. Too much alcohol, not good. But in the end, uh, I sort of see uh, cannabis is like that. And I, I want to see a two-tier system so that the medical people can grow their own. You can brew your own alcohol. Um, and and uh, I'd like to see people not be taxed on that, to go to a dispensary through their at licensed producers the way it is. But on the side, give places like this a license the way we have it in other places so that someone can just buy a joint like it did in Amsterdam, pay exorbitant tax. We pay 17% on alcohol. I don't care. Give me 17%. And I'll, you know, and, and, and just put it back into um, the way it should be, like, so that recreational people, like, I know tons of my customers, they just want to come in, they got a babysitter, they're happy, they got one joint, they split it, tee hee, and then they're home by midnight, and they're, n most of those people are out, like, twice a year, you know, and so I, I, there's a, an awful lot of them, and it's, it's like an iceberg theory, you know, we up here, we just the tip. Those one joint people, those Christmas smokers, that's the, that's the base of the eye. There are so many more of them than us. And oddly, you sell them one single joint, tax it out, that's a lot of cash. So I just, I'd like to see a two-tier system that way. Great, thank you very much. Amy? The word monopoly. Just like <laughs> <laughs> that's what scares me about legalization, a government monopoly. I am so for legalization. I think there's way too much money spent on imprisoning people, on tearing families apart, and then trying to fix those families with social services. Like, let's end that now. Um, the, but the problem is, again, the government monopoly. With a government monopoly, that means that there won't be any small-time growers. What about the mom and pop who can't afford their own medicine who'd like to grow it? But they can grow basil, why can't they grow cannabis if this is a plant, right? So I think we just discussed this too, Tracy. Like we just discussed because we were on the you know, we just discussed this the other day. I do, I am hundred percent for legalization, but a complete government monopoly is very scary to our industry because that means that we have no no control over our medicine anymore. No control over what, what we can and can't have or what, what gets taken out of the plant or is put in. Um, whereas right now, I mean many a few of us still do have our growing rights and, and we can grow our own and we don't have to worry about the toxins that could possibly be in it. I mean, we send out cannabis through licensed producers and then still have recalls. So like, let's call a spade a spade at this point, uh, <laughs> right? Right? right. So I, I mean, I think everyone should be able to grow that sort of thing. And legalization would, would, would save this country so much money that could be put towards much more important social issues. Yep. Okay, um, I, that word monopoly is terrifying. Um, and I think, it, you know, the way that we're looking at the business acquisitions in the LP movement, we're certainly seeing monopolies turning up, aren't we, in this industry? We're already seeing a monopoly in medical marijuana, and I, that's what scares me. Um, uh, people may think I'm an idealist, but, you know, my dream is, yes, you know, we, let, we stop charging people, we, we drop all those charges, um, and we regulate and legalize like beer and wine. So you have your small, you know, brew your own kit for home. You have your boutique wineries or beer, craft beer. And then you have your mass produced Sawmill Creek Tilray stuff. Um, and, but the key in that as well is that then you also have free medicinal coverage and dignified access for patients who need it.
And that's my ideal legal framework, is that that's what we need to actually have, is that, you know, like, like many people who have been surviving in this business in a black market um, have been doing already, is we let that recreational side take care of our medicinal people that are most in need because, hey, you know, if Tilray can get $14 a gram from the recreational market, why can't we then give it to patients for free? Mm -hmm. Great. So from what you guys are saying, I, I hear things that personal growing is very important, but also that a distinction made between medical and recreational is very, very imperative to any type of legalization that, you know, uh, we're discussing right now. Um, so do we think that the MMPR is going to be the template for like legalization? And I'm going to say this because in places like Colorado, it was the legal medical industry that was one of the really big players at the policy table. And it in fact really influenced the way legalization unfolded there. So do you think we're going to see something similar where, you know, we're going to have kind of a licensed producer type system? Um, you know, similar requirements in terms of security and, and, you know, kind of the bureaucratic hoops you have to go through to become an LP. Um, is that going to be the template for legalization? Well, while I appreciate that, you know, the LPs are new here. And we were the legal people first. <laughs> I, I didn't want to... <laughs> We were, we were the legal people, we, we were the medical community, we were the, med we're, so we were the ones that really should be at the table for policy. And while I appreciate that they've got the money to buy the seat to be there, um, I, I'd really, you know, again, ideally love to see them actually consult with us to think, to find out what we think. Health Canada? Um, Health Canada, anybody that's building federal. The, the federal government, anybody who's looking at building this policy, I think, especially when you look at what's happening in other states, is that the legal, the, you know, the states have become legal and their patients have been left behind. So I think we need to make sure we don't make that mistake. We learn from that mistake and the first thing we do is take care of our patients and then we look at the recreational side. <laughs> patients, that, 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 that classification of that drug needs to change and that's what needs to happen first is we need, you know, in any, in any emergency, you know, uh, the, the people at risk first, yeah. always. I think that what we have going on is we have people in suits, and I love people in suits, don't get me wrong, but we have people in suits making decisions for sick people and these people in their suits don't have any idea what these people are going through. The ones that started, you know, that, that have been here, the grassroots people that have made this an industry. Um, so I, I really do think that consulting with people as such would be a great idea for LPs. Um, I'm not against LPs whatsoever. Um, I think everyone serves a purpose. Um, and they're, I think they're great for people who live far and cannot access other places for medicine. And it's great for a mailing situation. But there's other people who really, really need one-on-one -on -one help. They need the human contact. They need someone to explain it to them in a way they can understand, whether it be visually or it, it, not everyone learns the same way. right? So we need to take this all into account when we think about all these things, I think. For sure. For sure. Um, do either of you guys want to add anything? I have another question for you guys. <laughs> so I was thinking a lot about, you know, um, the role that kind of vapor lounges. So I know it's a bit biased because we're at Vapor Central, but the role that they kind of could play in this kind of larger template. Um, do you guys think that they should be included in the framework as some type of like licensed business? Should they be, you know, should, should we offer people space, you know, to be consuming cannabis under kind of a more legalized regime? Well, I think there's def a definite need for it. Uh, vapor lounges have always been a safe place to consume in the illegal market. So paying $5 at the door, I don't know if that's going to still be the case. Well, people still want that. Uh, I, I, I could see us moving more towards a cannabis bar where we're actually dispensing as well. Um, like a bar would. You could go and buy a, a dab or a, a shot or a vapor bag. Um, so I, th I see us moving more in that direction in the legal market that what a vapor lounge is will change. Yeah, I think it's, it, that's awesome too because I, I kind of look around the room right here now and, and again, working in bars my whole life, I don't, I, visually I don't see a difference except that everyone's real calm and happy <laughs> <laughs> and there's no fight in the corner. 
no one puking in the corner. It's awesome. So I don't see why they wouldn't give us a license. It's like, why wouldn't you put in every neighborhood a nice place where people can go and be calm and happy? I just don't see why. I can't. I can't. And, and I think the more, like, Toronto's popcorning like crazy. And you have people come in and they always ask me, oh, how do you get away with this, man? And, like, the only thing I'm like... Well, you're smoking the weed, not me, so I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> kind of the way it works. Don't smoke cigarette, please. I'll get in trouble for that. But that's basically the only hinge we in Toronto sort of have. There's a couple of small hinges, but in the end, as long as we don't smoke tobacco or we don't sell any weed, we're fine. The cops don't care. Most neighborhoods all over Toronto, they're like, sweet, they're over there. They're not like, and then in the end, I think that because we're a little bit ornery, so when we get caught in this, we're like, oh, you're targeting me. <laughs> but, well, yeah, because we're stuck in an alley. So if we have way more of these places, just at start, you don't even have to, like, give us a license to sell. Just give us a license. I mean, Toronto's talked about it, but in the most retarded ways. So we, we've never been down with the talks in Toronto, how it happened. But outside of Toronto, I don't, have they talked in Vancouver about licensing it out there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I'm not the best at following. Have been in the, dis the vapor lounges have been in the dispensary discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but we just, in Toronto, we just have, but then there's a ton of bars in Toronto I just smoke at in their patios and they don't stop me. Right, so that's why I kind of brought this up because the laws in Ontario around smoking are getting kind of tighter and tighter. So the spaces that people <coughs> can actually smoke cigarettes are getting fewer and fewer and this has implications for, of course, you know, medical cannabis users as well. So, you know, just this idea that these spaces become really important places. I think Toronto also have fairly certain, correct me if I'm wrong, actually the bylaw says tobacco in it. It yes. doesn't in Ontario. say smoke. It's yes. So that's why we argue that. It is specific to tobacco. So we, the reason we have these heat resistant bowls is because ashtrays are actually illegal to have because it's an invitation to smoke cigarettes. So we have these heat resistant bowls to avoid that part of the law. But, um, I think that with the e-cigarettes e becoming so much more popular and there is attention being brought on that, there's the risk that they might say no more vapor inside eventually. So there's all kinds of things. We're trying to be involved in those discussions so that cannabis can be somewhat exempt from the e-cigarette laws that are happening here in Toronto. But there's all kinds of things that we'll have to stay involved in and keep our opinions heard. I don't trust e-cigarettes. As a patient and, and someone that, you know, frequents these establishments. I, I love the progression that they've taken over the years. Um, one of the things I love is like now that I know, if I know, you know, somebody does use cannabis, when they ask, you know, where can I go see a comedy show? I don't send them to Yuck Yucks. I send them to the underground. I send them to Vapor Central. Um, you know, that, that these, that our vapor lounges are actually known across the country, and especially Joey's, because she's done such a great job, are known worldwide as being yeah, our vapor lounges are world-class comedy clubs now. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And so appreciation and what Chris and Aaron do here with Pot TV and, and how they use this, this lounge as a platform for political movements and, and education and information I think is absolutely amazing. And I'm, the fact that they're popping up everywhere over southern Ontario with the help of other vapor lounge owners um, and you know, the first with Abby, who's here. She started the first one here in yep. Toronto. Cheers um, to that. You know, I think the progression of these businesses, I think it's gonna only gonna grow. I kind of, I, I dream of a day, not that I'm much of a drinker, but wouldn't it be awesome when, when someday we can actually do this in a place with a liquor license too? We currently have that in our province. Well, it's not, well, we'll see how long that lasts. I just wanna <laughs> add to Tracy's thing. Um, I think it's important also that if you open a vapor lounge to be a platform. I yep. think that we're all like talking and preaching to the choir, but right now we're out there. Yep. So I think that regardless of whether you support stand-up comedy, whether you support live music, because there's a lot of real good musicians that got some great shit to say, whether you support poetry, whatever the fuck you're saying on the stage, excuse my mouth, I think it's important though that like don't just capitalize on the industry charge money and just so people can hang out. Let them speak and uh, use, this, use your place as a way to advance. Yep. For sure. yep. oh my God. Yeah, I agree with Joe. Um, I think that 
our industry responds to that. The community supports those who give back. Um, there's so many great brands like Skunk and Crop King Seeds who have just given so much, and I, I think that they've gotten the benefits from it because we just love people who support back. That's great. Sure. Um, so my next question, so we have time for about two more questions, then I'm going to leave about 10 minutes to see if anybody in the audience wants to ask a few questions. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, you know, we've been hearing a lot about the dispensary, dispensary explosion in Vancouver, right? So they're talking about, you know, uh, at the municipal level, kind of having regulations around space. Um, but is that something that, you know, Amy, as a, as a dispensary owner in Toronto, is that something that you'd like to see Toronto do? Sorry. Uh, in terms of creating regulations around dispensaries. I would love, love to see dispensaries regulated. They've been around in, Tor in Canada, or at least in Tor Toronto, since 1994, am I correct? Six? Seven. Is it? Okay, I'm like, it, it's in the mid-90s, yeah. yeah. and yeah. there's still no regulations for dispensaries. I think that's ridiculous. I mean, we spend so much time on other issues. This is something that affects thousands and thousands of Canadians and we haven't even batted an eye at it. I would love to see it. I love seeing new dispensaries open up. Um, you know, because if they cater to many other people who can't necessarily go to other places, like it's not a, a competition thing, like we should be open like donut stores and like fruits and vegetable stores. Do you see there ever being kind of this system that exists where LPs and dispensaries can kind of work together? Because we don't want to talk about dispensaries as if there isn't, you know, this kind of yes. system happening. But I like, is there, is there a future for the two of them to work together? I could definitely see how that could work. Um, the only thing is, is then in no offense, I think the LPs would have to step their game up a little bit first in, in quality of product. Um, I daily hear, hear members tell me how they are so unsatisfied with their licensed producer um, because if their cannabis comes ground up or looks like crap or does not affect them or, and, you know, and that's where, again, dispensaries, you can come in, you can see the product that you're about to uh, purchase to medicate with. It's a lot different having the one-on-one -on -one contact than it is just ordering over the phone. I do think we can work together. I just think it hasn't really been put on the table. I mean, it's been talked about quietly, but I've never been approached by an LP, um, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne, did you want to add something? I just want to have a quick um, about regulating these sorts of places. Um, working in restaurants my whole life and having a food inspector, health inspectors check the place to make sure that whatever random teenager you hired to work your your, your th is following proper health codes. In, in especially in the cannabis industry, I've noticed a variance in how it's served from nicely in jars with plastic gloves on, tongs, whichever, so that your germs don't get on the pot of somebody whose sis, uh, immune system might be compromised. So s I, I've learned from, I worked at Toronto, Ham or Toronto uh, Compassion Center many, many years ago, and I worked with Jim, and he was the first person to teach me that, because he has AIDS. And he explained to me, he's like, y you don't understand that when germs are around, you're not gonna get sick, but I will. And you're, you won't even notice them. And I thought of him, like, oh my God, my fingers on the pot in the bag, and then he touches it, and he's got a cold immediately. So I think that regulation is important and needed to just make sure that people aren't getting sick, that people aren't getting germ spread, and that, that weed is being dispensed properly. Um, I don't know if the licensed producer picked his nose before he put it in the bag. <laughs> don't know it. I know she didn't. I so. didn't. Well, I mean, that's, that's just kind saying. of... Just that's, that's the regulation. I mean, they're under some, the LPs are under some pretty strict regulations right now. But I think, I think it's really interesting, um, something in, in the activist movement when you're working in medical, it, I always, like, there seems to be like the, the six year fallout where you're in about six years and then you kind of lose your mind and you get frustrated and you don't know whether or not you want can keep doing this because, oh God, this is so hard and why is it so hard? And either people walk out of the industry or they, they're, they're, it's this their calling and this is where they are. Um, and so I, I talked to somebody about that and they were talking about how they had to learn how to detach. And I think that's the problem is that um, one of the things that makes Compassion Center so wonderful. And, and I think when we're talking about dispensary regulation, I think we need to recognize the work of all the dispensary owners that have already come, in, you know, come before us is with the work of CAMCD that are actually working on those regulations so we self-regulate and, and those things are already... I, I love 
the fact that you know Toronto Compassion Center here, and there's a there's a number of different dispensaries across the country that are looking to get certified. I under was going to say maybe explain a bit about CanCD for people who don't really know. Okay, uh, so that oh, wait, I have to, all right, I have to get that. Can oh God, the Canadian, Canadian Association for Medical Cannabis Dispensaries. Yeah. All right, I had to like think about that for a second. Okay. Um, so, and, and I know that there's a couple people in this room that have worked with that group. Um, they're a bunch of dispensary owner, uh, owners and directors that came together and went, okay, so what can we do to ensure that we self-regulate themselves so that anybody who calls himself a medical cannabis dispensary is following the safest standards and best practices of this business? Um, so they've put together a, a guideline of... of um, certification protocols that dispensaries can follow to get um, certified by CAMCD as an, an authorized and inspected dispensary. And I think really that's amazing and I think that's really the model we should be looking at. It's been in the works since the beginning of my career. Like I, I, I remember reading the initial one that I believe it was Riel and Philippe Lucas put out. Um, a long, long time ago. And, and the fact that that is, is coming, I'm loving the fact that Vancouver is actually consulting with those, those documents and actually looking at those rules and, and how um, to regulate dispensaries. I, I LPs want to start se selling through dispensaries? Yeah, um, I've got no problem with it. It's great, yeah. Yeah, so just to kind of, you know, for the last kind of kind of question or idea that I want all you guys to kind of throw out there before we have a really short kind of question period is, um, you know, we talked about what it's like for you guys as women working in often male-dominated spaces. Um, what would you tell women who are just getting started in this industry, maybe as an entrepreneur, an activist, a researcher? You know, what would you what would be your kind of elevator take-home message for them? Well-behaved women rarely make history. <laughs> Take no shit, just keep going, stand your ground, and, and believe it every day. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. Amy? I wouldn't really say that. I'm pretty well-behaved. <laughs> but I would say, do it. Stand up, do it. Don't let anyone tell you no. I mean, this industry is meant for both sexes. This is not, or this may have been a male dominated industry as we discussed, but it's not anymore. There's a lot of women in this industry and we just need to recognize them. And that's the reality, it's recognition. So let's start recognizing the women and, and give them credit where credit is due. Um, I'm a huge believer in, in empowering women and hiring women. In fact, in my shop, I didn't want to hire men. Offense, <laughs> but I wanted to bring women up. I wanted, you know, <coughs> put them in roles that they belong in, um, that they want to be in, not really belong in, but the roles of, of authority. Um, and it, it's time to step up and let girls have that, or women. And it's time to tell women that you can do this and show them how. So it's really a matter of bringing up all the people around you, and that's that. Great, thank you, Amy. Joey? Um, I guess any advice, and this probably would file even to men too, but you want to do anything in life, just put it in your sight. You will never get it unless you put it in your sight and walk towards it. You might have to go a little bit this way, a little that, put the fucking blinders on. Don't listen to people's opinions. Don't respond to them. Don't cause drama. Just do your thing. Okay. Thank you, Joey. Aaron? Yeah, I agree with don't cause drama because that can be hard to avoid sometimes, like Tracy said. See, people sometimes have like a time limit to how far they can go, but... Uh, <laughs> I think people often underestimate the, the power of hard work and I think that as long as you're determined and you show up and you keep working hard and you don't give up, then you'll get to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Great. So now I think we're going to turn attention, well actually let's give our panel a round of applause for being awesome. And for, com and for committing their time and, and their dedication. Oh, thank you. And, thank to, you. and to Jenna for... Oh, for <laughs> and a this lot of the questions today, you know, I got feedback from all of you guys. So you guys were also, a, you know, a really important part to crafting questions that were meaningful um, and kind of drew out kind of women's experiences. We are at a historic time and uh, hopefully we can get all our friends and neighbors out there and let's get rid of these guys. It's not just in cannabis area that they've done a lot of damage to Canada, you know. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982 was brought in by Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jean Chrétien, and it has saved us 
from a horrible situation. If it wasn't for the Charter, if we hadn't become a constitutional democracy in 1982, we would be in serious trouble. Thank God for the independent courts who have stood up to this stuff and struck it down as being unconstitutional. Very few places in the world that you can do that. You can do it in Canada. Thank you.